Hello, everybody. I'd like to uh, thank Yanez for putting this together. He did a great job. I think the show looks good. Uh, I'm not going to take too much time. I'm just going to basically introduce what the show is. I think you all know that this is the trash and stuff that was gathered from Steve Kurtz's house when the FBI invaded back in 2004. Uh, we, the Yes Men came with us when we were cleaning out the house and they decided they would keep the trash. And at the time we thought that was a little odd, but uh, later on we decided, like four years later actually, it was like 2008, uh, at a point when the case had begun to look pretty bad and it like, looked as if Steve may have to actually go to jail and we were running out of money for uh, fundraising and we thought maybe we put a show together we can, uh, because the, the, the prosecuting attorney was constantly giving out press releases and, and press conferences saying, you know, what an evil person that Steve was. And we had no, no vehicle. We didn't have a platform like that. But we had, we had Hall Walls Art Gallery in, in Buffalo, and they said you could do a show. So we decided with the uh, Institute for Applied Autonomy, we put this together called Seized, where we showed the evidence that we had collected, which was the trash that they had put out, um, the little notes that they had written to themselves as they were uh, going through the house, uh, we have here on this table is like some artifacts. These were what we call puzzling evidence. This, this is things that the FBI took and they, we got back and somehow they thought were pertinent to the case. And if you look through them, I'm, you know, I, I can't see any incriminating evidence in that collection of, of, of documents there. Um, but I thought as, an, as a way of introducing all this, I might show you and talk a little bit about, not too much time because like you said, we're standing. but a little bit about the history of CAE and how we've constantly interacted with some level of authority throughout our career. Um, we are five different artists that have worked together for, at least Steve and I have been consistently been together for 25 years. And all that time, the thing that kept us together was that our common interest in essentially uh, uh, re resisting and, and, and interfering with what we saw as the more authoritarian uh, aspects of culture and the more <coughs> injustice of capitalism. And so in that vein, the work that we would do as subversive or um, um, like um, interfering with, 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 the, the, with the flow of, of capital would always bring us into conflict at times, uh, varying different levels. Uh, one of the first times that we, that we were very surprised, at, you know, we, we, back in 92, we, um, um, we decided to get rid of an RV and we drove around the state of Florida doing performances and uh, giving out free postcards and things of that nature and just basic interventionist tactics around the state. And one of the performances was our performer, um, Dominguez here, um, was, would, um, would set up this little toy car track and do cars around it, little Winnebago, and had little army men around Mickey Mouse. And invariably, every time we would set this up, cops would come. I mean, it's like we, we, he was just sitting off to the side. This is at Daytona Beach. There's people driving up and down the beach and bungee jumping them off of cranes and things. But a man playing with cars on a small, and you can tell he's still getting the stuff out of the bag. He hasn't even set it up here. And the cops are already standing there. And the crowd's gathering around. They're like, what is this guy doing? And immediately we'd have to kind of break it up because then the cops would start interacting with the crowd. The crowd would be like, what are you doing with him? He's just playing with cars. And it's like, you know, he's obviously crazy. We have to do something about this guy. And because Rick wouldn't, he, he had his tape player going with a little monologue that he had set up about exit culture because the, 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 the whole work was inspired by some work by the, Arthur and Mary Louise Croker at the time, uh, and we had done a project earlier with them called Exit Culture, and so we decided to take it on the road and actually test it. So, you know, we did things like this, and we encountered problems. And, um, and later on, actually very close to here, and we did this show here, actually, um, when we did Flesh Machine, um, which was back in 96. 97 actually. And in Flesh Machine, we, did, we were dealing with reproductive technologies. And um, I won't go into a lot of detail on the, on the, on the actual event, but we would take 
samples from people's DNA and collect them and go through, like, um, we had an online quiz. Some of you may have even taken it uh, back in 96 where you would go through and you would fill out a questionnaire as a sperm donor or as a, as a uh, uh, and, and, and you would either get rejected or accepted into the database. Um, and since it was dealing with reproductive technologies, um, the issue of abortion was introduced to it. And then in Vienna, when we were doing it there, uh, the Archduke of, of, of whatever, of the, of, you know, the Catholic authority there in Vienna, challenged us to a, a, a televised debate, to debate um, um, abortion. And Steve would never do that again, but at the time he accepted it. And he went on to debate a man who had control of everything in the situation in a language he didn't speak. And he said, and it went terrible. <laughs> um, and, you know, we've done, uh, after that, we went on. This was one where the, the, the authority that we interacted with was, uh, was more of the corporate level. We were doing a show in um, Washington where we were, um, we were growing genetically modified canola that was a Monsanto product that's designed to um, resist the broadleaf herbicide Roundup. So they can grow these in the fields, they can spray them uh, with uh, the herbicide, and then herbicide doesn't affect the plant. And at the time we were doing a basically public science experiment where we were trying to develop a uh, uh, spray that you could put on the plant that would make the plant then susceptible to the Roundup. So Roundup would indeed kill the plant. Because at the time, and still now, Monsanto has a policy that if, if you're growing an organic crop and it's in the vicinity of one of their genetically modified crops and it cross-pollinates with their crop and they test your crop and find that you're using their genetically modified product at that point, they then charge you licensing fees for using their crop, whether you intended to use it or not. And the courts were upholding their claims and making people pay these fees. So we were thinking that, well, if their pollen can fly over the field and hit our crop, then our spray can fly their way and get on their crop, which would then kill their crop. Um, because uh, when they sprayed it with a herbicide, it would kill it. And so we were trying to do experiments with that and immediately got confronted with Monsanto's lawyers telling us that we should stop and cease and desist and that we, you know, threaten us with civil suits. But the guys at the Corcoran uh, stood behind us and the show went on and we went on to do this a couple of more times in, in Amsterdam and, and, uh, and we never really got sued from them. But there was confrontation. Um, so as, as you go through those time periods and you go through years of doing this and, and getting, um, um, I'll show, well, one more I'll show you too, because this one was particularly, we had gone, you know, these other things, you know, you're messing with Monsanto, you're, you're talking about abortion, you expect some resistance on these things. This time, we had gone to Halifax to do a workshop with some students, completely inane. It was like we were just going to go there and talk about tactical media um, um, as a vehicle for intervention and deal with whatever issues they wanted to deal with. So they, we met, it, we initially met, initially met, and they said they wanted, Halifax is a, is a very tourist place, tourist destination, a lot of people go there for vacations uh, and holidays. And so they decided they wanted to produce a guide it was an apology for the things that they didn't like about their city. And so, I mean, they were very energetic and, you know, they made, um, uh, um, actually, let me go to the, they made, um, we met, uh, we decided that we were going to do these, this sorry campaign. So they made these little sorry bricks that they were going to plant at different spaces. They made uh, flags they were going to put up. Um, they made, we had a little uh, Beatrice de Costa help them do these little electronic gizmos, is what we called them, but they were basically like a little LED 
uh, screen that they could program in an apology on and it could apologize for certain things and they could post them around with double stick tape and just stick them on things to apologize for stuff. So they, that's what it would look like. Um, they made a pirate radio broadcast and, uh, and uh, made little uh, sorry t-shirts. I mean, they were very into it. We had a great time the whole week. We apologized for this piece of sculpture because it was just horrible. It's supposed to be a wave, but it, it was a great place for the skateboarders to play, but that's about it. Um, and then the, the phallic kiosk that they had, we apologized for those. And th there was a ferry that we moved from, from Halifax over to um, Dartmouth. And uh, Halifax had a thing where they were throwing their raw sewage out into the harbor. Um, and the ferry would then run right through it. <laughs> and so one of the students put an a electronic gizmo that apologized for the um, um, raw sewage on the ferry ride. And so we gave out the pamphlets, and the sorry girls went around and explained things to people. We set up the little radio. We put our pamphlet in with all the other pamphlets there. Halifax begs your pardon. And, um, and so we got all done, and then uh, it had a map to all the different sites where you could see the different uh, uh, apologies and explain why they were apologizing for each one of them. We got it all done and then we all went to the beach for the night and we camped out and we cooked lobsters and we had fun and, and the next morning we decided let's go back and see if, uh, if, we, um, if we made the paper. Maybe somebody found some of our stuff. And um, so we get the paper and we come back and it's across the front headlines, terrorist attack Halifax. And it's like uh, th they've closed down the harbor and pushed all the ships out on Friday afternoon in the middle of, of um, uh, rush hour because somebody had found a device on the ferry. And they thought it might be a bomb. And the story was that the guy had, um, had taken the device off of the, where the woman had left it in the uh, women's restroom. He took it to his boss. He looked at it. He calls the cops. The cops come. And they make him take it back in there, set it back down, and they bring in their little robot thing that goes in there to get it, to bring it back out again and destroy it to make sure it's not a bomb. And then uh, they find the pamphlet, and in the paper, the, the police are, are quoted as saying how, you know, they think there may be others around the city, and they're still looking. I'm like, if you have the pamphlet, there's a map to everything in there. It <laughs> explains everything. So that, that was the most ridiculous one. but it. But it still was like, it, it, it showed us that like, no matter what you're doing, you can still get in trouble. So you have to always be careful. Um, and with that, um, it brings me to the, and I'll close with this, um, because we need to just get on. But um, we did a project, which is documented back here in one of the videos, um, uh, Target Deception. And... I thought it was in here. But in Target De Marks and Plague. Uh, in Target Deception, um, we um, we were going to um, simulate with, with we started with Marching Plague and we were um, reenacting some of the um, uh, t uh, biological weapons tests that the British and the Americans had done in the fifties and the sixties. Uh, and even in the 40s, um, because we were arguing at that point that like, since nobody had ever created a successful biological weapon, it wasn't something that we should be devoting tons of resources to during the Bush administration to protect ourselves against these potential biological weapons. That, it, that was a dead product that had, had already been proven to never been able to, nobody ever created a successful one. And, and we wanted to show that nobody had ever created a, success, success, a successful one by reminding people of how many times people had tried. Uh, so we reenacted some of those uh, events. And we'd gone to Leipzig uh, to redo a test that they had done in San Francisco back in the, in I think the, the late 50s or early 60s, where they had uh, released it in, into a city and let it spray from one building and, and go out to another. And so we had, we had set up, um, and um, for Leipzig to be our, our, our target city, because we got you know, the funding to get there and go there and do it. And we were looking around and we were telling the guy, Frank, um, like where we really, see, there was this giant tower right in the middle of the city. And we were like, that tower would be perfect right up there. Like if we could get in that tower, we could do right at the American consulate from there. And um, he was like, oh, well, that's city hall. 
And we're like, oh, well, what else can we do? We could go somewhere else. And he was like, no, we could, well, I'll check with them. And we're like, well, you can't, we can't do it in City Hall. And he's like, why not? And he's like, well, they're not going to let us. And he's like, well, I'll ask them. So he goes to them and he asks them, he's like, we need to come in here on Saturday when you're closed. If you could just leave us the key, we could go up, we're going to take some stuff and we're going to spray some things out and, and then we'll clean up and we'll, we'll leave and we'll leave the key, uh, if that would be okay. And they were like, well, don't, no smoking up there. <laughs> and uh, he's like, well, okay, well, we're going to need electricity. Will you, can you give us an extension cord? And they were like, okay, we can give you an extension cord. Just check with the security guy for the key. And he comes back and he tells us, it's all on, we're good. And, and that's when we realized that like, the worst kind of censorship and the worst kind of repression ever is the kind that you internalize into yourself. When you start to, to self-censor yourself because you've already internalized the capitalist regime. You've already, you've already taken the authoritarian culture and, 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 and accepted it without, without any resistance whatsoever. And, um, and I hope we learn from that. I, you know, it's difficult to do, but that's what I would want to end on is to um, encourage you all to, to always resist authoritarian culture wherever it rises and, uh, and do what you can. Thanks. <laughs>